All right, good morning. So uh, we have been going through the book of Acts. It's an awesome book of the Bible. It takes place kind of in our time period in a sense that it takes place after Jesus had already died, resurrected, and ascended into heaven. So it's kind of like, what, what do we do now that Jesus isn't with us on the earth anymore? And that's what the book of Acts is about. It's about the church being commissioned, sent out to be witnesses into all of the earth. Fortunately, uh, they didn't have to do it alone. They were empowered by the Holy Spirit, right? God came down and dwelt his people and empowered them to be witnesses throughout all all of the earth. So that's, that's what the book of Acts is about. If you're interested in a Bible this morning, uh, my man Dan is going to be able to grab you some. Just raise your hand. We've got a bunch. You could follow along. We're on, let's see, what page will it be? Page 665 of these blue Bibles that he has. And if, if you want, you can even take that Bible home. That's our gift to you. And it's actually like a very modern, super friendly translation to read, right? Some of us already have them. They're, they're so good right there, Lisa. You're, you're coming to class prepared. I like it. So, um, so yeah, so we've been going through the book of Acts, and, uh, and I, I want to point out that any one of us who are followers of Jesus today, maybe you're not in that category, that's fine, we welcome you, we love you, we're glad that you're here, uh, you can ask questions later, we'd love to be able to answer those, uh, but any of us who are followers of Jesus today, any of us who are Christians today, the only reason we are Christians is because someone told us about Jesus that someone shared Jesus with us, right? And, and, and the only reason our generation even knows about Jesus is because previous generations, right, they sent people out as missionaries, they started churches, right, they, they spent money and resources and funds to, to translate the Bible and to publish the Bible and to make it available, right, it's a, available in hundreds of different languages, right, and, and that's the reason that we're here today, right, is someone was willing to tell us. For some of us, that might have been, you know, our parents. Maybe we were raised with some degree of Christianity. Uh, maybe uh, you went to a Sunday school. Maybe you just heard about Jesus, right, this past year, and you're like, who is this guy? Why, why are people so excited about this poor carpenter from the Middle East that died 2,000 years ago, right? Who is this fellow, right? And, and maybe you've discovered more and more about him, but the reason we know about him is because someone has told us. Right? And, and I, I, I'm not like a doom and gloom kind of person where, where you know, people say like, oh, the, the Christian church, right? Followers of Jesus, Christianity could die out in a single generation, right? Sometimes people will make that claim. And I don't actually believe that's the case because the Bible says that even if we are not faithful, he is still faithful, right? Even if we deny him, he cannot deny himself, right? That he will somehow make himself known to the earth, to each generation, because God pursues the people he loves, which fortunately is all of us. That's all of the world, right? So whatever our own maybe prejudices are, God loves the people that you might not like, all right? I just let you know that right now. That's why we shouldn't have any prejudices, just so you're aware. But, uh, but God loves everyone and makes himself known to them and, and reveals himself to those who seek him. All right, so we're, we're picking up an Acts today, and we're going to find out that, that God, right, the primary means to which he reveals himself, right, is his word, and the means by which he spreads that word is through his people, right, through us. And that's what we, we pick up. We see the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 16, uh, page 665, and we see the Apostle Paul, he's been traveling around planting churches, right? He's, he's a Jewish guy. Right? He, you know, likes hanging out in Israel, but he couldn't keep it to himself. Right? He couldn't just contain Jesus somehow in his own life and just be like, I'm, I'm just going to kind of do my thing and I'll just stay quiet. Because he knew that at that time, most of the world had never heard about Jesus. So he was ambitious enough to leave his home and to travel, and he wouldn't even feel comfortable staying in one place for a very long time. Right? He's like, this town already heard about Jesus. I've done my work here. I, I'm going to get going again. Right? I, I'm going to go to the next town. And he would just travel. And, and travel wasn't easy back that day. Right? Like he'd, I don't know if he's riding a donkey or a camel or he's taking ships at some point. He's shipwrecked multiple times. But, but he is passionate about spreading the word of God. That's what he's doing. So let, let's take a look at, at Acts chapter 16. There's going to be some maybe confusing parts here. 
and I'll do my best to explain them to you today. But Acts chapter 16, I've got it up on the screen as well. I'm just reading verses 1 through 5, so we're just taking a little chunk from Acts 16. We'll, we'll investigate some later sections of it in the coming weeks. But uh, here it says, Paul uh, came also to Derby and to Lystra. Uh, he's, this is actually the third time he's visited these cities. Uh, he would revisit the churches that he planted. And it says, a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, meaning a believer in Jesus, but his father was a Greek, okay? Uh, verse 2, Timothy, this, this fellow, right, he was very well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Verse 3, Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him. And now this is the part that's confusing. And he took him and circ circumcised him, okay, because of the Jews who were in those places, for they knew that his father was a Greek. All right, well, if, I don't know. Uh, for sake of this discussion, let's just say circumcision is a surgery in a very sensitive area, okay? Uh, there we go. Uh, and it had some religious connotations to it that the Jews required. So, uh, verse 4, as they went on their way throughout the cities, they delivered to them the observance, uh, for observance, the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. All right, that took place in Acts chapter 15, this big kind of figuring out, okay, what, you know, do Christians have to do? Do Christians have to become Jewish before they can become Christian? That was kind of the big discussion that took place then. The answer was no. Uh, so they're going to these churches, delivering this news, and then verse 5, it says, so the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. Uh, so, so that's actually, that last verse, let me just start right there at the end, because I'm just excited about that part right there. I love what our church gets to do. Right? When, we, when we investigate the Bible, when we ask questions about Jesus, when we seek God, right, we become strengthened in the faith. Right? We grow in the knowledge of God. We figure out more about who he is. We become more and more like him. That's something that I get excited about. So, you know, so for people who are like coming to church and are already believers of Jesus, that's where they're working on. Right? They're, they're strengthening their faith. Right? That's the area that they're growing in. But the second part I'm excited about as well, it says, and they increased their numbers daily. So these churches were growing in two facets. One was that the individuals were experiencing growth in their own life. Right? They were continuing to overcome sin in their own lives. They were continuing to become more and more like Jesus. And then the church was also growing in, in number, that people were hearing about Jesus that hadn't heard before. And they were accepting and receiving the salvation that Jesus offered. And the thing that I'll point out that I guess like kind of a lot of this sermon idea is based on is this last verse here. It says they increased in, in, in numbers daily. Notice it didn't say weekly. No, notice it didn't say on the Sabbath or on the Lord's Day on Sunday. In order for the church to increase in numbers daily, that meant people were talking about Jesus not just on the weekend. Right? People were sharing Jesus outside of the context of, well, let's go to the synagogue and talk about Jesus. Right? They, they were talking about Jesus in their, in their daily lives. And I want to point that out, that sometimes we uh, think that the way we can introduce someone to Jesus is inviting them you know, to come to a church. Or like, just you know, find out, ask your questions. It's a great thing to do. Right? But that's not the only way we can invite someone to see Jesus. In fact, that's probably not even the most effective way. Although, I mean, hopefully I've got something helpful to say that can communicate right, to someone to explain who Jesus was. Uh, but the, the idea is that this is a responsibility that's on, on all of us, that we are to, right, be sharing who Jesus is with other people, for, you know, during our, our regular daily lives. So, so let, let's go back to the rest of this passage and, 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 and break it down a little bit. So, so like I said, this is the third time that Paul had been to these cities. He had previously come there and, right, preached the gospel, Right? He gets persecuted in a bunch of cities he goes to. Uh, you know, he, they even tried to kill him a few times. Uh, so he, he preached Jesus there. Okay, that's first of all. He started a church there. They'd, they'd seen miracles there. There was this guy who was uh, unable to walk. He was paralyzed, crippled from birth. And Jesus healed that dude. And when I say Jesus, Jesus wasn't on the earth at this time. He works through his people, right? Through the people of his church, his followers. Right? So they saw this crippled man get healed. Uh, they had also established elders and leaders in their churches, right? They prayed and fasted, like, okay, who, 
Who's of good reputation? Who's, who can we, you know, who do we know that can, you know, help lead us to make sure that we're on the right path? Who can keep watch over our souls sort of thing, right? They established leaders. And, and he also would then travel around these churches to encourage their faith. And he encounters this guy, Timothy. And I want to point out that Timothy, he's actually this young guy. All right, he, he's even younger here than other parts of the Bible that are written to him describe him as being young in, all right? Because Paul uh, later uh, writes letters, First and Second Timothy in your Bible, to this guy. And Timothy is a pastor at the church in Ephesus at that time. But at this point, he's even younger. He is a believer. He's of good reputation. And he's going to travel with Paul to encourage these churches, right? He's going to just preach Jesus, right? And, and I'd want to point out that in terms of someone being a church leader, uh, it's not solely based on someone's talent to, to play music or to speak or communicate or to study, but their character and their reputation matters, all right? That when, when God establishes leaders, right, their, their reputation matters. Their, their holiness before God matters. And not saying that, you know, people are more holy than others, but in terms of like their less susceptible to sin, that, that they're fighting the sin in their lives, they're dealing with it, they're repentant before God, right? That they're, they're not just kind of going on unrepentant about the things that they're doing wrong, right? So, so reputation matters, and that's why, you know, whenever we hear of church scandals or different things like that, we, we get upset because it's like, man, what's going on here? And God's not happy about those situations either. So, so here's this guy, Timothy, and he's going to go with Paul on a missions trip going around planting churches, Right, going around encouraging some of the churches that were already planted. And there's this slight challenge that Timothy has. The challenge is that people know that he's only half Jewish, right? That his father is a Greek. And because of that, he will have resistance in his ability to reach the Jewish population. All right? And part of that is the fact that he, right, wasn't fully raised practicing all of the Jewish religion, Right? And part of that is in the fact that he was not yet circumcised, is what this says here. Now, I, I don't know if when you go into the synagogue, I, I hope that there wasn't some sort of bouncer that was determining whether or not you had this happen to you yet. All right? Like, I'm glad that our greeters here today didn't have to, uh, you know, check to verify, like, oh, are you, no, sorry, you got to you got to go sort that problem out. No, 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 like, right? I'm, I'm, I don't know what's going on here. I don't know how they would have known whether Timothy was, in fact, circumcised or not. I, it may have just been for the sake of his own conscience, so when he tells people, yeah, I've been, that he wasn't lying about it. I, I'm not sure. But either way, what we do know is that he did that for the sake of reaching a people group that he loved and cared about. Okay, that he was willing to do this to reach a people group that he cared about and wanted to share Jesus with because you might not be there yet, but, but sharing Jesus with someone, that's, that's good news to share, right? It's not bad news. It's like tremendously wonderful news to share with someone because like what Jesus did for us and who Jesus is, is like the most amazing thing ever. Just like, I, that's not even an exaggeration. I, I, I couldn't exaggerate it if I tried. But, but this is what we see is that Timothy goes through this experience so he could reach a people group that he cared about. And what's really weird about this passage is that the very news that they are delivering to these churches is the news that we heard about in Acts 15, which was the fact that you don't have to get circumcised to be a believer in Jesus. So what is going on here that Timothy has this done to tell people that they don't need to have that done? Like that, right? Isn't that confusing? Right? That confused me. I read that like probably a year and a half ago and I'm like, what? Like, that's weird. Like what's going on here? Right? I don't, I don't get this. It took me a while to figure it out. But this is the idea is that he was willing to do something that he was free not to do in order to reach people that he cared about. Okay, because it would give him access to, it would give him relationship with people that were Jewish. People that he knew that God loved and he thereby loved also. Right, that he was willing to surrender liberties or rights that he had in order to share the gospel with others. Right, so he wasn't doing this so that he could be right before God. Because he knew that that was not required to make himself right before God. Right, Jesus was the only thing 
that could forgive his sin and make him right with God. So he wasn't doing it as some religious practice. He was doing it as a means of cultural relationship, that he could relate to people that previously he was unable to, right? That's why he was doing this. And I I just want to point out like, wow, I don't think I'd be willing to do that, right? Like, I don't think I as a grown man would be willing to have something like that done for the sake of, I mean... I hope God works in my heart more that I could love people better, but man, Timothy, wow. High five to you. That's, I don't know, that's pretty crazy in my mind. So, so yeah, why would a Christian do something that they are free not to do, right? Why would he have done that? And the reason is that he would, the reason he would pay such a high price was because surely there was a reward that was worth it. And it wasn't a reward for himself. He wasn't self-seeking in this. This wasn't some religious, like, I get a pat on the back, I get a check on this box, right? I get, you know, some benefit for me. He did it for other people. He did it for other people. He did it for the sake of the gospel, that he would be able to connect with people that he ministered to, even though he didn't need to get this done for his own relationship with God. <clears throat> so, so that probably seems like a bit of an extreme to go to reach someone that does not yet know Jesus, right? I, I, that's, that's probably like pretty extreme. I would think so anyways. And I, I'm going to take a look at, at 1 Corinthians 9. This is a letter written by Paul. It's on page 689 in those blue Bibles. But yeah, you can open it up in your apps if you've got it. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 23. And Paul describes a similar motivation for his life when it comes to sharing Jesus with other people. Okay, a similar motivation. He, he covers this idea, and he explains it in quite a bit of detail. So, so this is kind of where, where I'm going to be looking. All right, I've, I've got my time down here. I, I'll, I'll be good. I'm not going to go over today, I hope. So uh, this is what he says, verse 19. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all. So he, he elects to, he chooses to subject himself to serve other people, right? You'd think, well, Paul's this super important guy. Like, you know, he's, he's, he's a little bit above needing to serve other people. But no, no, no. He chooses to serve other people, to make himself, to view himself as the servant of all people. And he explains why. He says, that I might win the more. Right? This, that's his reasoning. Right? That I might win the more. So, so we probably have the tendency to think that we're more important than other people. I'm not saying that about Christians in general. I'm saying that about everybody. We tend to think like our, of ourselves. I think I'm just kind of like important, right? Like I'm, I'm special. But, but, but the idea here is that we... You are special. Well, thank you, Stephen. I appreciate that. Wow. Oh, you're, I love you, Stephen. You're, you're the, man, this is great. This is a super encur- encouraging morning. I love it. But... But we should be willing to think of others more highly than ourselves, right? We should be willing to serve other people. <laughs> wow. Wow. What, what a morning. This is great. So, so we should be willing to serve other people, not to think of ourselves as too important to serve. And in fact, when Jesus talked about true leadership, he said that the one who is greatest of all needs to make themselves servant of all. Right? That was the mentality of leadership. And Jesus, who was God walking on the earth, he was one who was willing to even wash his disciples' feet. Right? He was willing to right, hang out with kids and communicate to them, right? not just be like, no, nah, you're not important enough. Like Your bank account's not big enough to hang out with Jesus. Right? Like, no, no, no. He would hang out with people. He would serve people, even though he was God. Right? Like, he's clearly more important than us. And he would be willing to serve people. And the reason that Paul states is that he would win more people. Now, now that, that terminology, that I might win more of them, he's referring to winning them over to Jesus, to inviting them into relationship with Jesus. That's what he would consider a win. All right? You might still not consider that a win. That's okay. That's okay right now. Let's see. Let's, let's look at the verse, verse 20. Now, Paul was Jewish by descent, but this is what he said, to the Jews, I became a Jew in order to win the Jew. To those under the law, I became as one under the law 
though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. Okay, that, that just said like under in law a lot there. But, but what he's saying is, right, I'm willing to go by rules that I don't need to so that I can reach those who live by those rules. All right? So he's, he's willing to reach Jewish people who practice the fullness of Jewish tradition, right? Even though he doesn't have to, right? We as Christians, we're liberated. We don't have to practice all of the religious rituals of the Old Testament, right? We don't have to do that anymore. This is really good news for us. But he would choose to associate with those people. Why? That he might win those who do feel that obligation. He says, to those who are outside the law, I became as one outside the law, all right? Those who don't practice the Old Testament, right? Not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, because Christ fulfilled the whole law, all right? And why would he do that? That he might win those outside the law. So when it came to Roman culture, the Greeks, the pagans, Paul would reason with them. He would associate with them. Right? He'd hang out in the marketplaces and he'd, he'd reason logically with them. He would even quote their own poetry and be like, hey, your philosopher says this. Right? Let, me, let me build on that concept for you. Right? Let, me, let me use that as a stepping stone to get you closer to Jesus. Right? That he would relate to people as a means of winning those right, who were not from a Jewish background. Verse 22, to the weak I became weak that I might win the weak. Now, he's not talking about physical strength here, right? Like, that might seem like that's been my personal goal. Like, I've been just, like, not exercising so I could relate to people who don't exercise. But that's not what he's saying here. Uh, he's not talking about that. He's referring to, actually, this terminology we saw a few weeks ago when we talked about um, when Christians disagree. And he said that there are those who are weak in faith, referring to the fact that they feel maybe an obligation to uh, not eat certain foods, because of the Old Testament law, or to, that, that they have to celebrate certain feasts or holidays because of the Old Testament law. Paul considered that person weak in the faith in the sense that, you know, there's full liberty they have in Christ, but they're not quite there to believe that yet. And so to those people, he's like, listen, like if this person doesn't eat certain meat, I'm not going to eat certain meat when I'm around them so that I could win them to Jesus, right? Like my rights to eat certain meat aren't more important than their knowing Jesus, right? Like, it's not, it's not like, no, 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 I get to eat this food. No, 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 like, they're more important than, than his pleasure, his comfort, right? That's, that's the idea. Let's see. And he says this, I've become all things to all people uh, that by all means I might save some. So that's the title of the sermon, by all means right? I might save some. So Paul was willing to become like people, to, to associate with people, to understand their background, right? To know where they're coming from, to learn about their culture, right? In order that he would be able to communicate to them better the gospel, right? As far as even like someone who's, who's a preacher, right? It's not just good enough for me to know what the Bible says, right? That's important, right? That's the basis of truth, but I also need to know what the culture believes or what the culture thinks because my goal is to, to bridge God's truth and where our culture is, right? If I, if I, it wouldn't be as effective if I was trying to reach our modern culture with Elizabethan English with an old King James Bible, right? Maybe there would be some English majors, right, or poets or people that would be like, wow, that sounds really, really interesting. But the majority of our culture will not effectively be reached with that tactic, right? Like, we need to know our current culture. We need to know the current issues that are at, at hand in our society so that we can better bridge the gap between them and God's truth. We need to know the questions that are burning inside of them regarding their own purpose and why they're here and what they were made for so that we could better answer those questions, right? The, different cultures have different issues that they face. Right? So if someone's a missionary, they're sent to a different country, it would be valuable for them to learn about that culture. Right? We don't want to send someone over there and just be like, well, just try to make that culture more like America first and then bring them to Jesus. No, 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 that's not the goal. Right? We don't need to make them more like America. Right? We need to make them more like Jesus. And, and for different cultures, that looks slightly different. And that's okay. All right? But, but notice, notice this phrasing that Paul had here. Uh, I've got a, a few snippets from each of the verses that he says, that I might, 
right? That I might. So, so if the next slide, I think there, Sam. Right, here we go. From each of those verses, he had this reasoning. He explains his passion. He communicates his motives here. And this is what he says, that I might win the more of them that I might win those under the law, that I might win those outside the law, that I might win the weak, that I might by all means save some. Paul's motive wasn't, well, you know, Jesus said I get rewards when I go to heaven. The more people I tell about Jesus, and although that is partially true, right, that's not his motivation, right? Like, Jesus isn't interested in a bunch of, like, selfish Christians seeking, like, you know, Boy Scout badges or whatever. Like, like, that's not the goal. The goal is the other people, right? The goal is the blessing for the other person. Paul's motive was that, listen, I'm willing to sacrifice whatever it takes for my personal preference or comfort that I might win the other person. It's the other person that he cared about. Right, like if, if, if I'm, you know, trying to like evangelize or tell people about Jesus and I just want to go on the street corner just so I could like try to prove myself right or to win arguments, that's not the reason why you should be doing that, right? The, the reason we should do it is that we might win someone to Jesus, right? right? You, I, I understand you probably might not even think that's like all that great of an objective yet. That's okay. I know. I know that that's, it takes a while to be like, I don't know, is that... I didn't wake up this morning thinking that was a, you know, my life's goal or mission. Like, I, it's not something I'm passionate about. That's okay. All right, that's okay for right now. <clears throat> but this is what he was willing to do. This was his motive. These other people, right? The, that I might. He communicates that at each point. But there's a word here that's perhaps a little bit more uncomfortable for us, and it's the word might. There's a condition here. All right, the word might. There's not a guaranteed success in all of these situations. Right, that there's a condition. Yes, Jesus died for that person. Yes, Jesus loves them and makes forgiveness available for them, but at some point there's a might because the responsibility lands on our hearts, whether or not we accept what Jesus did for us. Will we reject that truth or will we accept this forgiveness that Jesus makes available and then in our own strength be held accountable before God for our sin, right? Which isn't a place that I, I hope none of us think, right, my own goodness, my own righteousness is sufficient to stand before God where he's gonna be like, that person's really good. Like, come on in, come hang out with me. Like, no, 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 we're all guilty for some sin, right? Something before God. And that's why we can't stand in our own strength. We need God to forgive us, right? So, so that requires me to accept the forgiveness that God offers. And that's that might part there. Right, even uh, John three sixteen, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that who, whosoever believes in him might have eternal life. Right, that, that's the goal. It, the goal is that. God's made all available. He's, he's gone as far as he could to make eternal life, to make love available to us, but there still is that condition. Will we trust him? Will we believe what he said and, and what he did for us? Right? So there is that might there. So I want to point out that in Paul's instance, he was willing to risk, right, surrendering all of his personal preference or rights, even knowing that some people would still reject it even knowing that some people would still refuse Jesus. But that didn't somehow like be like, well, because some people will say no, I guess I won't even try. Right? That, that didn't discourage him to that point. Not nullifying the fact that that is a discouraging thought. That's a heavy thought. Right? That's hard to process. Right? Like, hopefully that's not something that we're like comfortable with. Of like, well, that person doesn't like Jesus, that's fine. You know, like... That is a, a, a burden to think about, right? That's, that's not easy, but that shouldn't discourage us from trying because these people are still worth it, right? This is what he said, that he might by all means save some, right? That was the end of verse 22. He's become all things to all people that by all means he might save some. 
He was willing to do whatever it took in order to reach those people. So by all means. Now, I want to point out what by all means doesn't mean, okay? By all means doesn't mean I'm going to disobey Jesus in order to reach other people. Like, that doesn't mean I'm going to go get, you know, go drugging with my friends so I can tell them about Jesus when I'm high, right? Like, that's not effective. That doesn't mean I should go out like carousing and sleeping with a bunch of people and then like during the pillow talk being like, hey, let me tell you about Jesus. Like, that's not effective. All right, part of our obeying Jesus is, uh, right, the fact that we keep ourselves unpolluted by the world, right? We are in the world, but we're not of the world, is what the Bible says, right? So we're, we're out amongst the people, but hopefully we're not acting like the people. And when we do, hopefully we're repentant when we're wrong, right? So it's not a matter of, by all means does not mean, well, I guess I need to start sinning to relate to sinners so I can reach sinners, no, you will sin anyway, just so you know. Like, you don't have to try to do that. Uh, when we're trying not to, we still mess up and fail. And that's actually even something that's helpful when communicating to people is being honest about our own struggle, right? Christians are not perfect. We're, we're just simply forgiven by God. That's, that's it, right? Uh, or, or some people I know, I've, I've heard, you know, they'll, they'll date someone who, uh, a Christian will date someone who isn't a believer and be like, well, maybe I can like, lure this person to church or, or tell them about Jesus or, you know, maybe I can get this to work out. And, and what's interesting is in some cases it works out where God does reach a person through that means. But God's ends does not justify your means, okay? Because the Bible says that God can use evil and still work it for good. So it doesn't mean I should go out and do evil for God to do good with. All right, does that make sense? Like, we should still be obeying God in the midst of our, our reaching those who don't yet know him. All right? Uh, or, or, I mean, Jesus said that we should be fishers of men. He didn't say that we should be the bait. Right? So we shouldn't be putting ourselves out there and trying to reel them in with us. Uh, that's, that's not how it works. Uh, so don't, don't just assume that because God maybe has used some of those situations to introduce people to Jesus that's not like the primary means to which we should ever be trying. But this is the idea. This is what the by all means means. Are we willing to lay aside our personal preference? Right? Maybe, maybe there's like a people group where you're like, I don't like the way they dress. I don't like the music they listen to. I don't like their culture that they're from. Are you willing to surrender your personal preference or way of doing things for the sake of those people? Because God loves those people. Right? God loves them just as much as he loves you. Right? Or, or, or I don't like that person's economic standing. That person's too poor for my, my taste. Or that person's too rich. I hate rich people. Right? No, no, no. God loves them. Right? We should pursue them because God loves them. Am I willing to lay aside my rights or my freedoms for the sake of the gospel? This one's hard for us Americans because we're like, no, 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 my rights, that's the thing I celebrate. I will blow up fireworks about this. I'm so excited, right? But no, 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 are we willing to surrender some of those for the sake of those that God loves? Right? I, are we willing to endure persecution even though it shouldn't be legal that we are persecuted and still being able to love the person who despises or hates us in the process? Are we willing to demonstrate God's love for that person in the very moment that they might be persecuting us for our faith, right? Like we should at times surrender some of our rights. Yeah, we, you have a right to not be persecuted in this country for your faith. But at times we endure that nonetheless as a means to demonstrate God's love. Are we, are we willing to lay aside our time, our resources, or our hobbies to reach people that God loves? Right, like, yes, we should, right, give to missions, we should give to our church, right, to spread the gospel, to, to fund that mission, but, but what about, like, giving up my time, you know? Am I, am I just going to spend all my time watching Netflix in the evening, or should I actually, like, lay aside some time of it to invite my neighbor over, like, come over for dinner, maybe spend some of my money, buy some more groceries, make a meal, like, hey, come on over, let's hang out, I want to get to know you. I'd love to be able to communicate to you about who... Jesus is. Do you have any questions about who Jesus is? Let's see. It goes. Sounds like the rescue truck there. Uh, 
It'll be all right. Those guys are good. Uh, do we recognize that our inaction may have an effect on the freedom someone else experiences? Okay, because th this is what this said. Is, By all means, I might save some. Does that mean if I don't do all means, fewer would be saved? Now, that's like a really out there theological question, right? Wrapped up in that, like if I do less, will God still reach the person I was supposed to reach? I mean, that's like, that gets way deep into God's, right, sovereignty, right? His foreknowledge, his preordained plan for our lives, right? If, if I do less, does that mean I will save fewer? That fewer people will encounter Jesus, right? That, that's a hard question. I mean, like I said earlier at the beginning of the message, when we fail to be faithful, he is still faithful. All right, God's got that all figured out. But that shouldn't give us like some cop out of like, well, I'm just going to kind of like just let things happen and those who are supposed to know Jesus will know Jesus and they'll be good. Like that would be the, the wrong attitude to have, right? Will we be discouraged by the fact that that word says some? and not all. Will we be discouraged to the point of inaction because that doesn't say all there? That we will encounter those who reject and despise and hate Jesus and thereby us. Right? Will that mean, well, because that doesn't say all, that means I'm not going to try as hard. I'm not willing to encounter that. I mean, this is something that I struggle with, guys. This isn't just like, well, pastor's all good at this. No, no, that's not at all. Like, I repent of this all the time. Because sometimes I like my own comfort more than I care about someone's eternal discomfort. Like, and that's like a terrible thing to think about. Right? Like sometimes it's like, nah, it'd be an awkward conversation. You know, like where we we're like, no, no, if someone like put a gun to our head and was like, do you believe in Jesus? We'd be like, yeah. But if it was like, would you be willing to tell that person across the street that you believe in Jesus? It's like, no, nah, they got their headphones in. They're kind of in their own space. They don't want to talk right now. Like, that'd be an awkward conversation. And it's like, we're not willing to suffer a degree of awkwardness for the chance. What if they're some of the sum? Right? What if they're the sum? Right? They're worth it. They're worth it. And like I said, I'm not good at this. This is something that I repent of. All right? But this is something that we should be passionate about. All right? That we're called to share this excellent and wonderful news, right? The gospel is good news. That's literally what the gospel means. Good news. Salvation has been made available from God to man. Forgiveness and reconciliation is available. Like, this is tremendous news. Yes, it is offensive to some, but it doesn't change the fact that it's really good news. It's really, really good news. Let's see. I got a, a letter from uh, the indigenous church planter, Ravuri uh, Jayaprakash. He's out in India. He sent me an email this Thursday. And um, I got it posted on the foyer there so you guys can read it. We, we fund this guy. He's a church planter out in India, uh, him and his wife. And uh, he sent me this letter, and it reminded me exactly of this passage I was preaching on. This is what he said. I've, I've got it up on the screen, a snippet of it. But just so you guys know, he loves you, he appreciates you, uh, and the fact that we were able to financially support them out there, uh, and he's praying for our church all the time. Uh, and if you want, you can read the letters in the foyer, and also it's available on our website. Uh, church planting is the link there. But this is what he said. This is a snippet. He says, I do not know all the techniques and methods of evangelism. Evangelism just means telling people about Jesus. He's like, I don't know all of them, but I, knew, I do know just one thing, that that is, in the morning, I go to God on my knees in prayer, all right? So he, he knows to pray for people. He knows to pray for opportunity. And in the evening, I visit the people with my co-partner, this other church planter, uh, John uh, Prabakar, I believe is his last name, and share the good news to the people as the Lord opens the, oppor uh, opens the opportunities and the doors, right? So this is what he knows. He's like, I don't even know if I'm doing it the best way. Right? I don't even know if I'm really good at this, but I do know I'm just going to be praying for these people and I'm going to give my chance, my opportunity to reach out to them because they're worth it. And now check this. Primarily, we visit the families which are in bad situations and circumstances. 
We comfort them and tell them uh, that we are there to pray for them. Right? This way we reach the families. And this last part, it's not a comfortable statement, but it says this. Some accept us, but many reject us. That's not a comfortable thought at all. Right? Like, that's not comfortable because that also will happen in our culture in Vermont. There will be people who get offended at the name of Jesus. Right? There will be people that are turned off by that. Right? We might shy away from sharing Jesus because we're worried about that rejection or because I don't think I'm going to be very good at telling people about Jesus. Right? Or I know of people that are like street evangelists and they're like super offensive and people get more upset because of the way they do it. Or, or there's like the Jehovah's Witnesses that go door, door to door and I don't want to go door to door now because what if they think I'm a Jehovah's Witness? Right? Like, it's, like we'll surrender strategy because we know that it's been done poorly in the past. Right? We, well, I don't want to do it the bad way. But the idea is this. Like it's more important that we're willing to try and fail and learn that we might save the sum. They're worth it. Right? It changes eternity for them. It gives them the freedom in Jesus that we get to experience, and I hope that we are not selfish and keep it to ourselves, because I know that's convenient, because we've got an awesome church family here. I love being able to just, like, hang out with you guys, but I hope I'm not only ever hanging out with you guys, right? We want to have, we want to have more people, not just for our church, but we'll start more churches to make that happen, right? It's not about Valley Town. It's about Jesus, okay? And this is what, what Paul says at uh, verse 23, Let's see. I do it all for the sake of the gospel that I'm, that I may share with them in its blessings. So the objective, the goal is still about the other person. That the gospel is a blessing to give someone. It is a gift of salvation that God makes available. Right? And, and the reason that Paul does this is for that sake, to be able to share that gift and so that he's not just hoarding these blessings to himself like a Scrooge McDuck, right? Like he wants to share the blessing of the gospel with other people. And one of the things I want to point out is that I know like thinking about this, like even in my own heart, like this is just like, you can walk away, away from these passages and just feel like condemned or like, man, I'm not doing a good job, you know, or I'm not, I'm not good at this or like, what's wrong? Like, I don't even feel passionate about this, right? What's wrong with my heart? Is there an issue? Like, like, this can just feel condemning, or this can feel like obligation of like, all right, I guess I just got to work this up and do this, but that's not at all what God would want us to do, right? The, the way that we get passionate about this is in understanding the gospel, in understanding the lengths to which Jesus went to make forgiveness available for us, to become infatuated with Jesus, Right, to grow in our love for him as we learn more about his love for us. Right? It, it's not through like studying these passages like, okay, how will I become better at sharing Jesus? It's no, I need to fall more in love with Jesus and then people will just see him in me. Right? Or I'll just be too excited to keep it back. Right? That's the idea. Right? The more I understand the, the implications of the gospel in my own life, the more I will be able to share it. Right? The more I realize the blessings that God has given me that I do not deserve, the more excited I will be to tell others about it. Right? So I don't want you to go home and like study like, well, I guess I just got to study and, or I'm going like to commit to sharing Jesus with this number of people. Like, I don't want you to do that this week. The way we get better at this is falling more in love with Jesus and preaching the gospel to us. Right? Just thinking about like, he's forgiven me. Right? He's made relationship with him available. Right? That God, through Christ, on the cross, was, was reconciling all of the world back to himself, inviting us back into relationship. Right? And this is like crazy good news. I'm not even going to put this verse on the screen, but it says this. This is, this is just like really good news to tell someone. That God was not counting the world's sins against them. That's in 2 Corinthians 5. It's on your bonus content as well. Right? That God, like, how good news is that? Did you know that God doesn't want to count your sins against you anymore? He wants to count you as not guilty. 
right? Like that's, that's good news to share. Of course, it comes with the implication that they are guilty, all right? But we all are. It's not like thinking that we're better than them. It's like, no, like I'm probably worse than you. And it's because I know how much God's forgiven me. Like, I can't wait to tell you that God has made forgiveness available to you as well. Let's see. Let's have, have the worship team come on up. I'm going to get cranking here. Whew. All right. And let's, uh, you can just leave that up on the screen right now. And let's, let's just pray this out because, man, God is good. And you might, I, I hope I've at least communicated vaguely what the gospel is. I don't know. That Jesus came on this earth, right? He lived a perfect life. He died in our place. He was innocent. We were guilty, right, to make forgiveness available for us. And then God sealed the deal by raising him from the dead. So it wasn't just like some guy that died and said that was the case, but God proved it so we can be confident that we are actually forgiven, right? That, just so you know. And, and there's also some verses on the bonus content you can check out if you want to learn what the gospel is, right? Figure out, can I communicate this? Okay. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, help us to realize the great love that you have showed us. Help us to not just focus on some degree of obligation, uh, some responsibility that we have to share with others, but help us to fall more in love with you. Help us just to appreciate and be thankful for all that you've done for us. God, God, right now, we thank you for your mercy and your forgiveness. We thank you that you do not condemn us, but you make forgiveness available to us, that you have made us the righteousness of God in Christ, that we, we stand righteous before you. That's not a word that describes any human, but because we are in you, we are seen as righteous. We have right standing before you, God. Lord, help us to be passionate about our community, about our friends, our families, our coworkers. Help us to, to share this truth effectively, God. Lord, we are dreadfully afraid of awkward conversations. We're afraid of offending people. Lord, we repent of that preference, that fear of offense over our love for you. Lord, I, I, we repent any time we've denied you rather than denying ourselves. God, help us just to be faithful to seek you and pursue you. Make yourself real to us in our hearts. Help us to pursue you and grow in holiness before you, God, that we would have a contrast, that we would be a light to this world in this dark place. And, and give us boldness, Lord, that when your uh, disciples were beaten and imprisoned for preaching the gospel, they came back, they gathered together and prayed for boldness. And we ask now, Lord, that you would give us boldness to share your truth, to share this good news with the world around us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.